<laughs> now, there's, there's the two sides of Eartha Kitt, if I may say, from the book, it seems. Mm. There is, there is the, the very vulnerable, innocent young girl mm. who was abused, as you say, and rejected. Yeah. And then there is the extrovert person. Um, when does one character stop and the other take over? Are you conscious of the two sides of your character? Very often I am, and then sometimes I'm not. And when I catch myself realizing that I have reverted back into being Eartha May, I have this to... This is Eartha May, which is what your name was in, when yeah. you were very poor, yeah. and your mother actually passed you on to somebody else. Yes, she gave me away to a family that would use, that eventually wound up using me as a, a work mule. And my mother gave me to this family because the man that she wanted to marry said, I don't want that yellow gal in my house. Which meant that being an Ill 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 illegitimate child and uh, also the wrong color. You are not wanted by the blacks and the whites couldn't care less. So this black family, who had two teenage children, used me as a, whatever they could use me as a working person. And then I was also uh, by the young gentleman in that family. Are you? Was, how uh, old were you then? I, I know people don't believe it when I say I don't know how old I am, but I really, I know somewhere I'm uh, way past 60. But how old were you then? Not way past 60, but I'm way past 50. But I was really still about five, six years old. And in all those that times. abuse going yes. on. Yes. And all of that abuse was going on, and I couldn't tell anybody about it because who would have believed me? And the young boy, he was not uh, the nicest kid in the world, and neither was his sister, who also. I, well, I didn't know anything about lesbians in those days. And uh, she too tried. And there were times when the whole family was gone into the fields or something like that, harvesting, picking cotton, or whatever they were doing, and we were left in the house alone. The two teenagers would tie me in what we call a croaker sack. I think you call it what, what potatoes mm. come in. Yeah. They would tie the sack around my waist and then tie me to a tree. And uh, with the peach tree switch, they would beat my bottom until I was bleeding. And I only had one thing to wear, and that was also made of potato sacking. And um, uh, they... Well, I can understand how, well, I mean, something, uh, I've been several years of that, that is going to mark you for life. Well, you try not to have it. leave a scar on you, yeah. emotionally or mentally, but of course, and even though the physical scars are gone, and uh, you start talking about it like we are talking about it now, and you try to not get emotional about it, but all of a sudden those feelings do come back. And the idea of them tying me to a tree, and you're not, you're not able to escape at all. Yes, and then you, you had a, an, an auntie, your, your, your mother's sister, who looked after you then in New York. Isn't that right? You went, you went to New York to your mother's sister, Auntie Mamie? Yes, Auntie Mamie. Did she look after you any better? No. My aunt was very, very strict. My aunt was a, a very tall lady. She was about six feet tall and also very fair in complexion. She's half Cherokee, very majestic looking. I was deathly afraid of her, even from the sight when I first saw her. I was terribly afraid of her. But she had no children of her own. She was never married. And I think that she brought me up north to New York out of a Christian duty, you know, because she got a letter from the South that told her that if I was not taken away from this family, that they would either starve me to death or beat me to death or work me to death. And therefore, she decided that she would take me on into New York. But she wasn't any better. She was you ran also away from, abusing me. You ran away from her, too? Yes, but, but I think... God certainly has his funny ways, you know, because I was trying to get away from her, but where do you go? What do you do? I used to uh, stay away from her as much as I could, and I kept running away. And whenever I had a few pennies, I could, the nick, it was a subway was a nickel, for instance. <laughs> and I used to get on the subway and ride from one end of Manhattan to the other hoping that the conductor wouldn't see me because they used to have conductors on the subways at the time. And then get off on the other end and get back on <laughs> and he couldn't see me. You seem to be... And just keep riding yeah. all night long until daybreak. Running but, away from your life. Well, I don't think I was running away from life. I was running away from... 
rejection. I was running away from not being accepted. Have you, has that stayed with you? That's what I mean, do you, do you find that, is that why you think perhaps you're an extrovert, that you're looking for attention, you're looking for affection? But Mr. Vogel, you know something? I'm not an extrovert. <laughs> I can tease as Earth the kid, but as Earth the may forget it. <laughs> I'm hiding under the, behind the bushes, behind the chairs, behind everything you possibly could, I could possibly find to hide behind. Because I never have been with that kind of security within Eartha May that makes me feel that she will ever be accepted. I don't think Eartha, in myself, in my subconscious. And when I'm writing the book, when I was writing the book, I, I realized that more and more. And that's why maybe sometimes I, I am going around with looking like an, the urchin that I really know I am inside of myself and not wearing any makeup and not caring about what I look like. That little ugly duckling has, was always told she's an ugly duckling. Nobody wants you. And she's trying so hard to find somebody that says, Earth mate, it's all right. You want it too. But nobody's done that yet. Maybe I have not given them a chance to do so, I don't know. But she keeps hoping. But you must, um, there must, people must have shown you affection and love in your life. Is it that you can't accept it? The public and my daughter, yes. The public. Never a, If never, it wasn't ne for the public, a man, a man has always wanted to lay me down, but he never wanted to pick me up. And the men that did have real love and affection for me were the ones that never touched me. That was Orson Welles, Ruby Rosa, and there were, there were a couple of real love, strong love that men have had for me. Two of them, John Barry Ryan III and Arthur Lowe Jr. But then the mothers step in. And I think very often the mothers, particularly with boys who come from extremely wealthy families and they are the only son, they would rather them marry trash than marry someone of color, no matter how wonderful a person that person of color may be. You've been a, a tremendous survivor in the face of things that most people would not have survived. Where, where do you find happiness? What, what, I have to find it within myself. Pleasure? And the wonderful feeling that you have when you're standing on that stage and that audience gives you that applause and says, Eartha, it's okay. You're still here and we're glad that you're still here. And when I see the young people, particularly today when everybody knows I'm past 50, whatever the number may be, does not seem to matter to them. When I see the people my age who have grown up with me in this business, they're in the audience and they've brought their children and their children's <laughs> children. Believe me, that makes me feel that I really am a worthwhile person. But then it's something else when I go back to the dressing room, because when I take off the makeup and I'm not Eartha Kid anymore, you say, okay, now, You're Eartha yeah, May. I'm, I'm Eartha May again. It becomes a testing ground. And I know that. No matter how hard you try not to, it's still there. I'm not afraid of it. And I'm very glad that I can have the feelings from that urchin. And I'm very glad that I have never tried to cover her up. I'm very glad that she's still a part of me, and I'm very glad that she will always be a part of me, because she helps me do what she knows I have to do out there on that stage, because there is where my survival is, with that public, and with those who, who know me well enough to realize that Eartha May, or Kitty, whomever they want to call me, she's okay. Well, we're very glad that you've revealed so much of yourself and been afraid, unafraid to do so, and it's, it's been a great pleasure to talk to you, and thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wogan. It's you. always a pleasure. <laughs> Both sides of Eartha May and Eartha Kitt, and our thanks to her. And, of course, to Linford Christie.